morning. Good morning, everybody. And on behalf of Tom and his lovely duty team, welcome to Sunday morning service at Claremont Parish Church. Whether you're here with us in person or thanks to our techie guys joining us via the internet or by telephone. And if you're a visitor or with us for the first time, either here or from wherever, welcome again. Tea and coffee, as usual, are available at the end, up the back. No drill is organised for this morning, but in the event of an emergency, please leave the building using exits to your left, to your right, or behind you. This morning, God's Word will be brought to us by the Reverend Gordon McCracken, our family talk by Miriam, and our praise led by the band. So let's now just enjoy a moment of quiet as we prepare to hear God's message. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. May I add my welcome to that which has already been extended. It's good to be with you again for worship this morning. Um, I'm going to make just mention of one member of the congregation who is currently in Stonehouse Hospital. Uh, I'm assured that Avril, uh, Avril Anderson, is going to be tuning in. I don't know if it's live uh, or whether she'll get it recording, but knowing her, she'll find some way of, of doing it. So, um, <laughs> Glad you're able to join us as well um, this morning. Um, we take as a theme for worship today, discontent in the desert. And we remember the reflection of the psalmist in Psalm 196. He said, they soon forgot what God had done and did not wait for his plan to unfold. In the desert, they gave in to their craving. In the wilderness, they put God to the test. Let us worship God. Let's sing to his praise and glory. Come, now is the time to worship.
Now we come before God in prayer. Gracious God, as we rose this morning to live another day by grace, did we give you another thought? Before we partook of our first meal of the day, did we pause and give thanks? Or did we take for granted that provision you make for us? As we formulated our plans for the day, did we first stop to seek your guidance and to include you in all our thoughts and preparations, seeking first the kingdom of God with assurance that all good things follow according to your will? Have we been as anxious to speak with you as we are with members of our family or our circle of friends? Or have we made you an afterthought, except maybe on a Sunday? And on the other days, have we unselfishly laid aside part of that provision that you have made for us so that we in turn might help others in greater need than ourselves? And as much as we pray, have our prayers been focused on self and our needs rather than on your glory and the needs of others? Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us amend what we are. Direct what we shall be, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Yes, Lord, we do pray for your provision all day long. Christ taught us to pray for our daily bread. So we do pray that you would provide for our genuine needs, for we know deep down that we would have no bread if you chose to withhold your blessing from the earth. But we pray also for spiritual sustenance. Help us to grow in faith today. And to pray daily through everything on our calendar or in our diaries, whether at work, rest or recreation. For everyone that we will interact with, that our dealings with others may honour you as we remain true to your word and our word. In the midst of our daily toil and in our rest, Help us to trust you with today and tomorrow. Not to worry about what the future holds, but to trust you always. Knowing that all things work together for good to those who love you, as we do. In Christ our Lord, who taught that when we are at prayer we should say, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, deliver us from evil, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Miriam. Good morning, church. Good morning. Um, it's been for the teenagers an exam time, um, so they've been going through tests and also the university students. Is any of you already finished with the tests or is still some to come? You're finished. Shall we give a round of applause for James for finishing all his exams? <laughs> is anybody else? Um, yeah, Satu is finished with first year at uni. Let's give a 
first round of applause. Is anybody still in the middle of the toil? Oh, are you finished as well? Yes, Gary's finished. Whoa. <laughs> Anybody in the middle of the toil still? Um, well, my daughter Dominica still has got two more. So um, anyhow, those who are still in the middle of the toil, we do pray that you will aim and focus and do well in exams. But success in exams does not only depend on how well you have prepared. There are other factors to the success of doing well in exams. For example, what's your teacher like? You might prepare all you can, but if you have, don't have a good teacher or inspiring teacher, you might not be motivated to study, or if you don't have a good teacher who prepares you well for the exam, even if you do your best, you might not do very well in your exams. And also, on the day, it much depends what the questions are. So who made the exam? What kind of questions there are? Are they very fair? towards what you've been learning to the module that you've been learning, or are they a bit cheeky or trying to trick you? So have you got any examples of unfair exam questions? Have they ever, or that, this can be for the adults as well, have you been in a situation that you've been asked a question or tested and it's been not correct to the level that you were asked to prepare, yeah? Okay, so James is telling he made an AI robot, artificial intelligence robot, to make a test for you, but he didn't quite do the test, the questions very right. Oh, well, I'm glad to hear that AI is still failing us. We still have a place to play here. <laughs> oh, well done. Anybody else? Or you can even think of it. There might be a situation in your life, you've been in a situation, you've been preparing, and then the test question comes, and you're like, this is not fair. I've not prepared for this. Nobody prepared me for this. It can be in life situations as well. Well, let's see if um, this is an unfair question to put to the congregation. Let's, these are from GCSEs. What is mitosis? What is mitosis? Anybody know? Ah, so it's a fair question for Christine. What is it? Cell division, yes, also from a biology exam, okay. What about this? What is the equation between charge, flow, current, and time? Are these unfair questions to you? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Anybody? Does Andrew know at the back? Sorry? Okay, well, um, I have here just, it's maybe simpler than that. It says charge flow equals current times time. All right. Okay, you probably know better than me, so there we go. <laughs> I'll just trust you to have the right answer, all right? Okay, what about English? The poem Tam or Shanter references which natural phenomenon in the skies? So poem Tam or Shanter, what phenomenon in the skies is mentioned in the poem? Do you know, Elspeth? No, but I've got a question. All right, do you have a question? Um, what if they didn't prepare you at all? That's it. What if you don't have a teacher and nobody prepares you for these questions? That's what I'm doing to this congregation. They're not prepared at all. And I'm giving them a question and wanting them to answer me. So what phenomenon in the skies is referenced in poem Tam or Shanter? Anybody? Yeah? Say it again. Correct. You've been listening in your, maybe you must be learning about Robert Burns in the school. So Aurora Borealis, the northern flights, uh, lights are mentioned in poem Tam or Shanter. Oh, somebody gave it to you then. <laughs> oh, oh, well, good guess. So that's what sometimes you do in exams, don't you? Just guess. Now, in today's reading, um, you will hear about testing God or God testing us. Okay, so it's interesting that in the Bible it talks about that sometimes God tests us or his people but it's also sometimes we test God. So I'm gonna talk a wee bit about that. So in, in the Exodus story, um, we have, in the order of service, by the way, at the very top there, it says, it comes from Psalm 106, by the way, not 196. 
Um, they soon forgot what God had done and did not wait for his plan to unfold. In the desert, they gave into their craving. In the wilderness, they put God to the test. So now God is suddenly the pupil and humans are testing him. In this example, to put, you know, you, you hear this sometimes, it says, you're testing my patience. When we are testing God, in this example, it seems to be a negative thing. We don't, the Israelites did not trust God's promises to take them to a good place. They did not trust God's motives that ultimately God wanted something good for them. They started grumbling and they wanted to go back to Egypt because there were good food there. And in the wilderness, they only got a certain kind of food or very, you know, not something that they were used to. But actually, in the Bible, there is also a good testing of God. In Malachi 3.10, it says, God says, test me. Test me whether my promises to you are true. Test me, bring your offerings to the temple, and you will see the blessing will flow. Bring, do what I ask you to do, and you will see how I act through them. That is the good kind of testing when we do it with trusting God. When, we, when the promises of God are given to us in the Bible and we say, I'm going to trust that that promise is going to be actually true and I'm going to see the evidence of it. When I put my trust and my actions according to God's will, what does the Bible say is going to happen to me? He is going to bless me. Not that we do only the instruction, not that we only follow him in order to be blessed, but there is a blessing in following God's ways. And how do we know it? Only if we actually do it. Only actually if we obey, we will see it in our lives. And God actually invites us that kind of testing. You have an issue in your life, you don't know what to do, check the instructions in the Bible. Do according to it and it will be well with you. Ultimately well with you. So let's think about that when we, try, um, when we are testing. Are we, what kind of testing do you involve yourself in? Do you test God's patience by grumbling? Or do you test positive way by saying, I'm putting my trust in it, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to see God act. Because I trust that he will, as he said. His word can be trusted. Now, um, that's the end of my talk, um, but I just wanted to make you aware that today I'm wearing all these boots and bringing a wee bit dirt into the house of God. Um, we are going out um, with the youngsters and anybody who wants to join us um, can join us uh, to the forest church. So we're going to the forest together and hence we're going to sing, um, we, go, we, go, uh, we shall go out with joy, you shall go out with joy. So you can maybe sing it to us, you shall go out with joy. We have some instruments here, so I'll explain to you while the girls are giving some instruments out, so you can give it to the young ones. Um, basically what we do at the forest church is, first of all, we make a procession into the park and we make noise. So we wake up all the neighbors. <laughs> and <laughs> so we make a public show of it. We carry a cross and we make a procession into the park. And in the park, we have the elements of the worship. We have uh, worship, prayer, and message. So these are the elements of worship. You know, when we come together, as a, uh, and so they, the kids are gonna hear a message, they're gonna ponder about the word of God, they're gonna pray, and they're gonna sing. So it is a service, but it's an interactive service. So anybody feels like they want to join us? Please do, if you have a good shoe wear and a jacket. So let's sing, You Shall Go Out With Joy.
We've got two readings today. The first one from the Old Testament, Exodus 16, verses 1, um, uh -huh, 1 to 12. And then the other one from the New Testament, from Hebrews, uh, chapter 3, verse 12 to 19. Yeah? Yep. Right. Okay. Uh, this one is entitled Manna and Quail. The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt! There we sat round pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you've brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people had to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, in the evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, and in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that, we should, that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, you will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses told Aaron, say to the entire Israelite community, come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked towards the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. Then we move fast forward to Hebrews. What's this? Chapter 3 from 12 to the end of the chapter. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. As has just been said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as you did in the rebellion. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Amen.
Thank you, Margaret. Um, we're going to sing now a, an older traditional hymn, but one that still has much to say to us. Your hand, O God, has guided your flock from age to age. I thought I'd start with a question, and maybe I should just have given you this question and then go on with Miriam and the kids. That would have been quite good. Just leave you to, disc you know, like an exam paper. Here's a statement, discuss. <laughs> but I'll not do that. But I'm going to ask you a question, and that is, how would you define a miracle? Anybody like to have a, a go? How would you define a miracle. Something you can't believe has happened. Something you can't believe has happened. Okay. Any other suggestions? Something unimaginable and unexplainable. Something unimaginable and unexplainable or inexplicable, depending on which uh, which way you want to put it. Anything else? Something beyond our understanding. Yeah, okay. Right, three very good answers. Our theme, of course, is this morning, discontent in the desert and miracle or something beyond our understanding, certainly, um, goes on in this story. Um, those of you of a certain age may recognize this man. I, I hear from laughter, a few folk do know who it is. Yeah, absolutely. 
It may be very hard to believe now, but back in the 1960s and early 1970s, this guy appeared regularly on BBC television, delivering popular lectures on the Bible that were considered accessible to the common man. For those who don't know or have perhaps forgotten, his name was Willie Barclay, professor of divinity and biblical criticism at the University of Glasgow from 1963 until his retirement in 1978. He himself told the story of getting into a pub in Dumbarton. He was going to buy cigarettes because he was a heavy smoker. He went through several packets a day. He was going to Helensborough for some do, and he was dressed in evening wear. Not your, exactly your everyday wear in Dumbarton even back then. So he goes into this pub in Dumbarton, fully dressed, and some shipyard workers started to stare at him. This curiosity, who is this guy? in a pub in Dumbarton. And then one of them piped up, hey, you, mister, I can you. You're Joan Fela Barclay that does the talks in the telly. I've got a question for you. I want to be able to get guys in pubs today to be able to say, I've got a question about the Bible. Sometimes happens, but not very often. The pub, he said, absolutely erupted. Everybody wanted to ask Willie Barclay a question. And when he finally had managed to deal with a number of them, but said he had to leave to get to this do, they lined up to shake his hand. And according to Willie, they apparently paid for his fags as well, which was <laughs> much to his liking. Such was the popularity of the man. Willie Barclay is considered to be one of the greatest communicators of the gospel in relatively modern times, and his daily study Bible series is still a very popular source of devotional reading for many. I don't know whether any of you use it or not. Others, however, consider some of his views on the Bible to be almost heretical. They were certainly liberal in interpretation, and some of his stories were a bit dubious. He never gives his sources. But there's no doubt that he could, as a, to, to paraphrase an advert, there's no doubt that he could reach the parts that other theologians couldn't reach. I have recently been reading his book, The Mind of Jesus, which he wrote back in 1960. It's lain, I've got to confess, on my bookshelf unopened for the best part of 30 years. And I thought I'd read it again before disposing of it, dear, since my wife's been at me to get rid of some books. <laughs> the ninth chapter of Barclay's book, The Mind of Jesus, is devoted to the miracles of Jesus. And I want to read a brief extract from it, as today we think not so much about the miracles of Jesus as such, but about the so-called miracles of the wilderness. Barclay writes, when we try to understand the miracles, we are met with an initial difficulty, the difficulty of defining a miracle. And he goes on to say, to define a miracle as something which is impossible is a quite inadequate definition. So take it for Willie Bartley, not for me. For who is to define the possible and the impossible in any way which is not relative to his own position in time and in progress? This, having cited as one example amongst many others, the perception of a Roman charioteer watching a machine travelling through the air faster than the speed of sound. Well, seeing that he lived in the age of Concord. But you get the point. What for one generation seems inexplicable may well be to other generations something they can understand. Now, that kind of popularism with these kind of stories, and there's umpteen of them you could give, but that kind of popularism certainly did not endear Willie Barclay to many of his contemporaries or even modern scholars, and he still has many critics. 
And I confess that I do at times scratch my head and think, Willie, how did you come to that conclusion? But at other times I have indeed been very grateful to him for his ability to unlock seemingly unfathomable passages. Without going into too much detail, since I don't possess his incredible communication skills, he goes on in this book, The Mind of Jesus, to identify three different classes of miracle, deriving from three different words used in the New Testament. These are dunamesis, works of power, Teraz, something that produces wonder and amazement or astonishing occurrences. That one, however, is not actually used of the miracles of Jesus as such. But what is used is, sorry, Simeon, which means sign or significant event. Now, the text of St. John's Gospel tends to speak more of signs than of miracles, such as the turning of water into wine. Some people say it's a miracle, but John says it's a sign. In chapter 2, verse 11, he says it was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory. Now, when we turn to the wilderness and to the experience of the Hebrews or children of Israel, we come across great signs, which might well be considered to be works of power or something that produced wonder and amazement. But equally, they are significant events and certainly signs of God's presence and provision, what we might call his providence. I like Mortia late principal of Trinity College, Bristol, in his exposition of the book of Exodus in the Bible Speaks Today series of commentaries, speaks of what he calls anticipatory providence. I'll say that again. Just give me a moment to take it in. Anticipatory providence. And he does so pointing to three great events, miracles, in the story of the wilderness wandering. These are the making unpalatable water drinkable, the feeding by manna and quails, and the providing of water from the rock, all part of chapters 15 to 17. We're only looking at supposedly 16 today. And he points to the fact that the miracle was largely in the timing to meet the needs of the Israelites. There's nothing terribly miraculous about the quails, because quails do fly by night when migrating in great numbers at certain times of the year. And certain kinds of insects called aphids do exude excess sugar absorbed by trees which fall as white globules to the ground. I'm sure the Israelites didn't know that. Perhaps they were not that well up on nature. Maybe take a Mr. Attenborough or somebody to have um, elicited that for them. So it's more this um, anticipatory providence. Even the solitary tree used to cleanse the water, he points out, was placed at the pool of Mara years in advance by God, just for the moment when it was needed, as indeed was the hidden spring below the rock all part of God's anticipatory providence. What are we to make of this explanation of these miracles, these works of power, wonders, or signs? Well, let's recall the story then in a little more detail. The setting is, of course, the Sinai Desert. The people have left Egypt They've crossed the Red Sea or Sea of Reeds. They've not yet reached Mount Horeb or Sinai, two different names for the same place, the place where they will receive the Ten Commandments. What they have experienced, however, thus far, 
is some difficulty in finding drinking water. We are told at the end of chapter 15 that they travelled through the desert of Shur for three days without finding water. And when they did, at a place called Mara, they found the water to be bitter tasting, quite unpalatable. And so they grumbled against Moses, saying, what are we to drink? But drink the water they did, for God instructed Moses how to make the water palatable. If you want to look into that a bit more, go to the end of chapter 15 and read it privately. But it's to do with that tree. Indeed, over the course of chapters 15 to 17, not once but twice, indeed, God intended, eh, God provided them with drinking water during their journey as well as feeding them on manna and quails. He enables them to go on in the toughest of times. Now, you might have thought that following even that initial incident, they would have learned that God will provide, but of course, that's not human nature, as Jesus well knew. Even hundreds of years later, Jesus had to say, as it's quoted up in the slide, do not be anxious about what you will eat and drink. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And so because human nature is what it is, fallen and distrustful of God, they continued to grumble against Moses and Aaron, and indirectly against God since they were his appointed leaders. They were now one lunar month into their journey. And little could they have known that a further 39 years and 11 months would pass before not they, but their descendants would enter the promised land. They themselves, because of disobedience, would not enjoy that experience. They didn't know that. But even here, for a second time, they expressed their discontent in the desert. Now, I don't intend to spend any great time this morning on the story of the miraculous feeding by manna and quails. Margaret Payton, who read for us this morning, covered that story a few weeks ago in a children's talk. I think about three weeks ago, Margaret, was it? So hopefully, if, if you remember that, but if you want a refresher, you can get it online. She spoke then, too, about the grumbling. So, instead, what I want to do this morning is draw attention to something else that Alec Moiter wrote in his exposition of chapter 16 of the book of Exodus, something that touched me when I read it, and it does come under the heading, God's Purposeful Ways. Let me quote. More than anything else, what bothers us when trouble comes is our loss of a sense of purpose. We cannot see why these things are happening to us, and it is at this point that Exodus addresses us most forcibly. The God who created us and redeemed us never ceases to work out his purpose for the whole cosmos, for the church and for the in, every individual in Christ. This, he goes on to say, was how it was for the Exodus pilgrims, and it remains true for us today. That nothing ever touches us except by God's determination and in accordance with his will and in order to achieve his purpose. Let me repeat that. Nothing ever touches us except by God's determination and in accordance with his will and in order to achieve his purpose. He is too great and he loves us too much 
to allow it to be otherwise. Now, of course, in the midst of trouble, that can be a hard thing to see. And for many, indeed, sometimes it's a teaching too hard to swallow. But Mocher goes on to outline the need for perseverance in the face of adversity, as well as the importance of trust in the Lord, trust that he is in charge and will not fail us. With reference to the first chapter of the epistle of James, which addresses the subject of trials and temptations, Mocher also talks of testing. Talks of how the people tested the Lord and how the Lord tested the people. And how only God stood the test. And yet, even so, his people can come through the time of testing by his grace and only by his grace. As a second reading today, however, I chose not the epistle of James, but the epistle or letter to the Hebrews, which in chapter 3 directly addresses the story of the discontented and rebellious Israelites in the desert and gives a lesson that we as Christians need to learn from their experience. The writer uses that old story as a sort of parable or illustration. He too teaches perseverance. Verse 14 of chapter 3. We have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. There are times in most folks' lives when their faith is tried by circumstance or perhaps by some doubt over what they once believed. And I think that's certainly true, not least during this period when the world is less accepting of the claims of Christ and when the church itself appears to be prepared to go the way of the world when old certainties are challenged. We need to remember that none of this comes from Christ who is the same yesterday, today and forever. It is believed that the letter to the Hebrews was written for people who maintained their Jewish ways whilst attracted to Christ, but who were under temptation to turn aside from him and to give up this new faith in the face of adversity. But according to the writer, that would be a fatal move. Only those who hold out their confidence in Christ to the end will be saved. Using as a teaching aid the fact that those who rebelled in the desert did not themselves enter the promised land. You get all the theologians this morning. Raymond Brown former principal of Spurgeon's College London, in his exposition of the Hebrews' letter, writes, Passing through the Red Sea was fine, but once they came up against difficulties, they rebelled against God by opposing his servant. They doubted God's presence by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? And concludes this warning from the past would certainly not be lost on those Jewish Christians in danger of defection and apostasy. As the hymn writer Josiah Condor said, the Lord is king who then shall dare resist his will, distrust his care, 
or murmur at his wise decrees, or doubt his royal promises. We are in a different place from those early Christians. And we are certainly in a very different place from those Israelites wandering in the desert. But just like all of them, we are in this journey of faith together. And we need to encourage one another along the way. As the Apostle Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. We may hope to be and do indeed work at being an encouraging and supporting community. But people can fall through the cracks. But if any of us ever find ourselves in a dark or isolated place where we are uncertain whether God is with us or not, and even if we don't feel confident about sharing that with another person in order to get some support from them, this story, this story of the Israelites can still serve as a reminder that God is actually always near, always providing, always hearing our cries, and always ready to respond. It encourages us to look up. At the same time, we do need to remain open to him, remain attentive to God's word, Remain persistent in our faith and hold fast to our confidence in Christ. And we will find, as people of faith in the end always find, the truth inherent in that old biblical name, Jehovah Jiri, the Lord will provide and prevail. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Let us stand and confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed, following which we will go straight into singing the hymn, What a Faithful God Have I. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
And now Adam and James are going to come and lead us today in prayer. So, good to see you, boys. Oh, down to one. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we pray firstly for those who are affected by the war in Ukraine. We pray that you would help them in their struggles in finding places to live, in countries where they are safe. Help them to be able to find places for work and help them to get the aid that they so desperately need at this time as the war continues. We pray for those who are affected by natural disasters, such as the people in Italy who have experienced severe flooding and have had their homes flooded as a result. We pray that you would help them as the relief effort continues, and we pray for the families of the people who have lost their lives as well. Lord, we pray for the kids and teenagers around the world who are setting their exams around this time, that you would help guide them to achieve the results they want and to help ease their nerves as they go on to wait for these results. Lord, we are thankful that we can join together to worship you, and we pray for those who are persecuted for their faith in other countries. We pray that they will someday be allowed to worship you, just as we do, without fear of being found to be criminals in the process. We pray that you would give the G7 leaders meeting in Hiroshima wisdom in laying out strategies around limiting climate change and allow them to all agree on how to tackle this global issue. We also pray that you would aid the leaders of the nation in helping those who are affected by the cost of living crisis. We pray for those who are waiting for a diagnosis or for treatment in hospital, and we ask that you would help the the NHS workers to be able to catch up on the backlog of patients that are still waiting for the care that they so desperately need. Lord, we may have some people we wish to pray for ourselves, and we pray for these people now. Lord, we pray for these things in your name. Amen. Thank you. Morning, everyone. Um, Thanks to Adam for that prayer. And thanks to Gordon for our message this morning. Gordon and Jess are off on holiday tomorrow, aren't they lucky? Um, so we hope you have a lovely time and a nice rest and then come back and start all over again. It will be nice to get some sunshine. <laughs> oh, it will be nice to get some sunshine, yes. Yeah, so have a nice time anyway. Um, can I just draw your attention to the notice on the um, update about the very, very sudden death of Richard Durno, Minister to the Deaf. Um, that happened on Wednesday. On Wednesday, later on on Wednesday, there was meant to be a service of union between the Deaf Church and Queen's Park Church. Um, that the service of union didn't go ahead, but they had a, um, a service for Richard because it was too late to inform everybody that it had happened. So we just pray for the whole Deaf community and um, for everybody that's affected by that. Richard not only was, there, he was only one of two ministers to the Deaf in the whole of Scotland. Um, he, t- he had the whole of the west of Scotland t- to cover, um, and now there's nobody in that post. Um, he also ministered to the deaf in other places, not only in the church. So we just ask you to be with all these people, to remember them in your prayer. And can we pray especially for Anna, who is at Queen's Park Church this morning signing for them. Um, it will be a difficult time now for all of the, the deaf community in the west of Scotland. We are blessed by having Anna here and Alison, um, and the fact that the, we live stream the services means that the deaf community get the, receive the Lord's message um, maybe more than they would have done without that technology. So we're, we're grateful to that, but we ask you to, uh, to keep Anna especially in your prayers as she is um, going to have a wee bit of an extra, well, probably she could have quite a big load to bear if she doesn't 
do what she's told and just take it easy. But anyway, um, we'll pray with her anyway, and we'll pray for her uh, and for the whole community and, of course, for Richard's family, his wife and his daughters. Um, just to lift the, the, the feeling a wee bit, Avril is online and she says hello to everyone. <laughs> so um, it's nice to know that she's still joining us. She's up at Stonehouse Hospital now. Uh, yesterday's coffee morning in aid of Blacklaw um, Primary School's outdoor library was a fantastic morning. It was really well attended and um, everybody who uh, supported them is thanked by the school. Um, £575 was raised um, for them, so that's, that's it for me. Um, a reminder that there's a football, a, a football tournament this afternoon down at St Kenneth's, the Interchurch um, football tournament. It's in Kenneth's Primary School at 2pm. Claremont Marvels, our team, will be taking part, so we wish them well. And if, if anybody's got a free afternoon, please, and the rain stops, please go in and support them. Um, and we, we hope they have an, a good afternoon. Um, now, on Friday evening, it was our BB prize giving. Um, I couldn't be there. I was, I was um, invited to go along, but unfortunately I couldn't go. But a great evening was had by all. And um, it, was, it was so nice to hear about all the, the awards that were presented. And amongst others, there was James Smith received, received his President's Badge. So well done, uh, James, for that. Um, Craig Shanks and Jack Gray received their Queen's Badge, which I'm told is the highest award you can get in the BB. So well done. And, uh, but uh, Craig also received, was also the very, very first recipient of the Ian Harrow Award. And that is for commitment to the BB, the church and the community. Well done, Craig. Hannah, where are you? Do you remember when you used to run up to that? <laughs> and um, Ted Priest used to sit there in his, in his chair and encourage him. <laughs> and I was going to say to be as wild as Heather, but then I remembered that Heather's no wild at all. So <laughs> I think she's left the building at the moment. Um, but um, well done, Craig. What a, what a change. <laughs> it's, you, it's well deserved, all your awards. Um, and uh, that's all I've got to say. Uh, Catherine's going to say something about the afternoon tea. Good morning. Um, as you know, we're planning on having some tea this afternoon tea on the 10th of June. Um, the tickets are almost sold out. I do have a few left this morning, so if you'd like one, please come and speak to me. The afternoon tea is to raise funds for East Kilbride Hospice, who are, in, like all charities just now, are really struggling. This year, their fuel bill has increased from £25,000 to £87,000, and that's just their fuel bill. So they really will appreciate any help that we can give them at all. We hope to have a nice afternoon and to make it work I really need some volunteers to come and to provide sandwiches, cakes, scones, meringues and things. But to make it work well and to balance it all out I need to know what you would be able and willing to provide. So this morning and for the next couple of weeks I'll be at the back with my clipboard and I would like you to come and tell me what you could provide for that morning, for that afternoon. So Thank you. It's an old cliche that I heard, but it's true nonetheless that our service is just about over, but our service is about to begin. And this closing hymn in some ways reminds us indeed that the work of the church and of witness to Jesus Christ is something that never ceases. So let's close with what is a, a mix of the traditional and the modern, facing a task unfinished, we go to all the world.